All right, this is Physics 1B for September 27th. And we have a lot of topics that I want to discuss today, so I may go through some of these problems a little more quickly. And I apologize for that, but we are kind of, uh, could you be asked to move to the second group for the lab? Um, no, that's not really something that uh, I can ask answer quickly. Um, usually it's okay, but I need to check the, um, the, you know, the, the number of people that are in there. And uh, you're always welcome to move to the second group if you want to find someone to swap with. So maybe if someone wants to say in the chat from the second group that they were willing to swap with Noah, then we could probably handle that right now. All right, so what we did last time was we talked about thermal expansion. And just to give you a summary of how that works, we said that if you have an object um, that is subjected to uh, a heat change, or sorry, a temperature change, that you could calculate its um, thermal expansion by doing this calculation right here. And I wanted to do another problem that I believe shows up on your homework, but there's really nothing like this in examples in the textbook. So I wanted to do a problem to handle something where two different objects were expanding at the same time and they had different materials. So this was the equation we had. And right here, we have the table that tells us all of the, the values of the coefficients of linear expansion, this quantity alpha is uh, found from this table. Delta T is the change in temperature, and L0 is the initial length of the object. So here's the problem we're going to look at. So it says, a poorly designed electronic device has two bolts attached to two different parts of the device that almost touch each other in its interior. So you have steel here and brass here, two bolts. Um, the steel and brass bolts are at different equipotentials, and if they touch, a short circuit will develop damaging the device. Electric potentials are like voltages, basically. Um, the initial gap between the ends of the bolts is five micrometers, or five micrometers, at 27 degrees Celsius. At what temperature will the bolts touch? Assume the distance between the walls of the, the, walls of the device is not affected by the temperature change. It's a lot of words, but... The question is, at what temperature will these two objects touch each other? Given that they have an initial length here of, looks like about, what is that, one centimeter? And three centimeters and they have a gap of five micrometers between them so this little tiny gap right here we want to figure out at what temperature will these two <clears throat> touch each other how can we go about doing that Okay, Troy says we find the change in length for both. So each one of them we could write down an expression for the change in length, right? We could say the change in length of the steel should be equal to alpha for steel times its initial length uh, times the change in temperature. <clears throat> Since we're finding the temperature at which they both um, touch, I think it's okay to assume that this change in temperature is going to be the same for both of them. And then we have the same thing for brass. So we'll have delta L, we'll just put B for brass is equal to alpha B, L naught B, and then delta T again. Delta T will be the same for both of these. Okay, then you're saying, find out when they cross over and add up to the five micrometers. So how could I turn that into a mathematical expression, Troy? How, what do you mean by that? Can you, can you say that in a, in a way where I can take these two things that I've written down here and turn it into an equation? Said something about adding up. Anyone else have an idea? We know that each one is going to expand and we want to find out when they touch each other. OK, 
Okay, so you're saying we should try to do change in length of the steel plus the change in length of the brass, which would be... Okay, so um, do we solve for delta t? Well, in these two equations, you you see you can't solve for delta t, right? There's two unknowns. There's this one and this one. Is that clear? Okay. So, what about this equation, though? What uh, Troy is saying, he's saying to take all of this, take the change in length for both of them, and just make that equal to 5 micrometers, right? And then fill everything in, and then you can solve for delta t. So I think you're right, Troy. I think this is going to work. So let's give it a shot. So we have uh, 5 micrometers. Alpha for steel is on this thing right here, 3.6 times 10 to the negative 5. Sorry if you can't read that, but that same table is in your textbook. So uh, this is degree Celsius inverse. Okay, that's alpha for steel. The initial length of the steel is right here, 0 0.01 meters. Uh, times delta t, which is our unknown. I'm going to factor that out. So I'm just going to pull delta t out and to the end over here. Because that's what we want to solve for. Uh, plus alpha brass. Brass is in this table as well. 6 times 10 to the negative 5. Looks like brass expands more quickly uh, based on temperature changes than okay, so, uh, steel does. We multiply that times its initial length, which is here, 0.03 meters. And then we can solve for delta t. We can divide this entire thing over to the left-hand side. So if you do that, and we also need to convert the micrometers to micrometers, or to, to meters. So 5 micrometers is 5 times 10 to the negative 6 meters. And you tell me, what do you all get if you calculate this? And anyone have any questions? Oh, whoops. It was all for volume. Oh, well, my bad. Sorry, so for the steel, yeah, I was looking at this table, my bad. This this is linear expansion right here, alpha, right? So steel is going to be 1.2. It should be 1 third. Steel is 1.2, and this one should be 2 then, right? For brass, yeah, it's 2. Okay, sorry about that. Thanks for noticing that, Christian. I appreciate it. All right, what do you get for delta D? You don't hear that, that lawnmower outside? Am I might picking that up? Okay, that's good. It's kind of hard for me to focus, but... I got delta T is... What'd you get? Anyone get an answer? So we got a change in temperature of 6.9 degrees Celsius. They were initially at 27 degrees Celsius. And the question is, at what temperature will the bolts touch? So we need to do 27 degrees Celsius plus 6.9 degrees Celsius, which would be 27 plus 7 would be 34. So it's going to be 33.9. Let's call that T final. All right, pretty easy. Once you know what to do, this isn't obvious at all, so I wanted to do one like this just in case people got confused when they're doing their homework. Okay, any questions? Okay, next thing we're going to do is we're going to talk about volume expansion. So we didn't uh, say anything about this last time except for writing down the equation because we got we just got to this at the end of class last time. So for volume expansion, here's the equation. It looks very similar. Here's a problem we're going to do. Let me. Um, Grab this as well because we'll need this. 
Okay, so for volume expansion, exact same, almost pretty much the exact same equation, right? It just says change in volume is equal to a quantity called beta times initial volume times change in temperature. So it's extremely similar in terms of the way that you do the calculations. Let's put this over here. So we want to solve a problem involving volume change. And here's one right here, which is an example of how we do this. So it says a 200 centimeter cubed glass flask is filled to the brim with mercury at 20 degrees Celsius. So we have a flask and there's mercury in here. So we've got mercury in here and it's filled to the brim. So this is filled with mercury. Um, it starts off with a temperature of 20 degrees Celsius. So the initial temperature is 20 degrees Celsius. How much mercury overflows? We need to find how much overflows when the temperature of the system is raised to 100 degrees Celsius. Let me expand this a little bit so you can read this. All right. How much mercury overflows when the temperature of the system is raised to 100 degrees Celsius? The coefficient of linear expansion for the glass is 0.4 times 10 to the negative 5 Kelvin inverse. Oh, one other thing. I mentioned this last time. I'm just going to mention it again. In this equation right here, beta is always equal to 3 times alpha. If you look at these things, like 2.4 to 7.2, that's a factor of 3. 2 to 6, factor of 3, 1 plus 7. All these are factors of 3s. Um, this is mostly because if something's going to expand in three dimensions, that's like, you know, three different linear expansions. All right, so... Uh, we have this mercury, it's in a vessel, the vessel is made of glass. And the question is, if the whole system is raised to a temperature of uh, 100 degrees Celsius, so we heat it up, heat up the entire thing to 100 degrees Celsius in whatever we want to, how much mercury will overflow? Now, according to volume expansion, this volume of mercury is going to expand when you heat it up to this temperature, okay? And the volume expansion coefficient for mercury is right here. Why do you think we don't have the linear expansion coefficient for mercury? And there's, there's other things that are over here that are not over here, right? Ethanol, glycerin. I don't know what carbon disulfide is, but because it's never solid. I don't think it's never solid, but yeah, it's, it's normally not solid. Yeah, that's pretty much the reason. I mean, certainly, if you cool it down enough, it will become a solid. All right, uh, so yeah, so from 20 to, okay, now there's glass, and they mentioned that the glass has this coefficient of linear expansion. It's linear expansion, right? Um, and I think that's because there's different types of glass, right? So they got to tell us what type it is. So what do I need to do to figure out how much mercury is going to flow over? We know the mercury is going to expand. Is the glass going to expand too? Or is the glass not going to expand? Yeah, the glass will expand too, right? So how do we figure out how much overflows if the glass expands and the mercury expands? Now, if the glass expanded faster than the mercury, would anything overflow? That question makes sense? Assume, this is not true, but assume that the glass expanded faster than the mercury. Would anything overflow out of here? If the vessel actually got bigger faster than the thing inside of it? No, it wouldn't, right? Okay, good. So yeah, good thing you understand that. But since the... Coefficient of volume expansion for mercury is 18 times 10 to the negative 5. And for glass, it's going to be 3 times this. That's going to be 3 times 0 0.4 because of this relationship. So it is going to expand more slowly. In fact, mercury expands a lot faster, right? The coefficient of expansion for glass is much, much smaller. Uh, 1.2 times 10 to the negative 5 degrees Celsius. In fact, if you look at all of the coefficient of expansions here for things like ethanol, which is a, which is a liquid, glycerin, which is, I guess it's a liquid or it's an aqueous solid or something like that. Um, 
not aqueous, uh, amorphous solid. I don't know. Anyway, things that are liquids seem to have a much larger uh, coefficient of expansion. I think that seems reasonable. All right, so how do we figure out how much how much uh, flows over? Did anyone say it yet? What, what do we do? How do we actually get to the answer now? We know something's going to flow over, even though the glass and the mercury expand. If we only found how much the mercury expanded, that wouldn't tell us how much flows over, right? Because the glass is also going to get bigger. So what do we need to do? Mercury expansion minus glass expansion. That's exactly right. So we're going to take the change in volume for the mercury. And we're going to subtract the change in volume for the glass. And that should tell us the overflow. Tells how much mercury actually flows over. So for delta V mercury, we'll just use this equation right here. We have beta for mercury, the initial volume of the mercury. We also need um, the temperature change. The temperature change is going to be the same for both. Okay, because it goes from 20 to 100. And we just subtract beta for glass, the initial volume of the glass, and then the temperature change, and that's going to equal what we're trying to calculate. Uh, this is like one of the rare problems where you're not doing any algebra, any calculus, you're just literally plugging numbers in, although you do have to understand conceptually what's happening to, to write that equation down, I guess. So plugging in our numbers, we have 18. times the initial volume of the mercury. Is that given? What do we use for initial volume? 200 centimeters cubed for the glass, right. So it said originally that it was um, filled to the brim, right? So it turns out that they both have the same initial volume of 200 centimeters cubed. We will need to convert this, but they both have the same volume. So actually, we can factor those volumes out. Let me write down beta glass as 1.2 times 10 to the negative 5. Hopefully you all can follow what I'm about to do here. I think you should be able to. I'm just going to factor out the initial volume, which was uh, 200 centimeters cubed. And I'll factor out delta T, which would be 80 degrees, right? And we can get our answer. Now we don't actually, now that I look at it, we don't actually have to convert this, do we? Because this is degree Celsius inverse, and this is degree Celsius. So our answer, this is fine. We can just get the answer in centimeters cubed. So I got 0 0.01344. Do you all agree? Anyone get the same answer? Really? Oh, I left off the 200, I agree. I got the same thing as what you just said. So 2.688, the number I got seemed kind of small. 2.688. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thanks for catching that here. Any questions about this linear expansion, volume expansion? It's pretty, pretty straightforward, but I can understand if you have questions, so please ask now as we're about to move on to another topic. Delta V. What is delta V? Oh, right here, delta V, okay. Um, it's because the glass is gonna get bigger, the, the container itself is gonna get larger while the mercury expands at the same time. That's the reason why. That's the reason why. So if, if, it was, if, the, if the glass didn't expand, then this quantity would give us our answer. 
but the glass is going to get a little bit bigger as well. So since the since the glass itself is going to expand, there's going to be more room for the mercury. Does that answer your question, Richard? It does? Okay, good. Okay, so if there aren't any other questions, I'm going to move on to talking about quantity of heat. I wonder if you all have learned about this before. I don't know. Maybe you would learn about this in physics 2A or high school physics? Not sure. Quantity of heat. So I think this was first something that was worked on by a scientist named Joule. What he wanted to do is he wanted to figure out, um, he wanted to figure out how to quantify uh, the energy associated with the temperature change. So I don't know if it was this class or the other class where I was explaining this, but um, we can define um, the, the phrase heat to be uh, an energy transfer. Due to a temperature difference. Did we talk about this last time? That if I have, yeah, I know two A goes over, that's true. If I have an object that's 20 degrees Celsius and I place it in thermal contact with another object that's, let's say, hotter than it, like let's say this is 70 degrees Celsius, heat is the flow from the hot to the cold. So that's heat, the flow from hot to cold um, of the energy of the 70 degree object to the 20 degree object. Now, later on in class, we're gonna learn how to calculate how much actual energy there is in a 70 degree Celsius object. But for now, our goal is to figure out how much heat is transferred from a hot body to a cold body uh, in this process. I keep hearing someone like breathing. So if you're set on um, like open mic, you need to switch to push to talk or mute your mic, please. Because it's it just keeps distracting me. I apologize, I, can't, I get distracted by the smallest things and there's nothing I can do about it. All right, so heat is an energy transfer due to a temperature difference. And uh, in case, sometimes I'm going to use heat incorrectly, but this is what we mean when we talk about heat. Now, how do you quantify how much heat there is? So there's an experiment you can do. I don't think we're going to do this experiment in this class, as far as I could tell from, from reading it. But we did this. Um, I did this experiment, I feel like, in college, but I also did it when I was a grad student in uh, um, you know, doing labs at my previous school. This is a really neat experiment. So just to give you an idea of how this works. Something like this was done by a scientist named Joule, who's the person we now use to talk about energy. All right, so this is showing the same temperature change of the same system and may be accomplished by either doing work on it or adding heat to it, okay? So there's two different ways that we are going to raise the temperature of the system, okay? One way is the normal way, part B, that's the easiest thing to look at. We have a heat source. Um, we're gonna you know, push energy into the water via the, the hot flame and we can directly heat it and come up with some temperature change. So let's say that we do this and the temperature of the water changes by three degrees Celsius, right? The question would be by some other method, can we also make the temperature of the water change by three degrees Celsius? And if we can, then can we quantify the amount of uh, energy associated with that? So this is a kind of general example of what was done. Let me make it a little bit bigger so you can see what's happening here. So what you have is you have string that's been wrapped around here Okay, and that string is connected to a pulley, which is then connected to a mass here. So you have this object, right? And it has a weight and that weight pulls down, right? Okay, now what you do is you take this vessel right here, which has the, the rope around it, okay? And one thing that's probably not super obvious about this, the idea is that there's a hand crank right here. It's, it shows this little circle. There's a hand crank and you're basically, um, you're holding your hand right here and you're just, you're rotating this like this, okay? And what happens is that the the rope will start to slip, okay? And this um, weight will basically just dangle. So the goal is to rotate this quickly so that as the rope slips right here, this object doesn't fall down. As a result of that, what's gonna happen is with the rope um, kind of slipping here, the rope is gonna rub against the metal. And by rubbing against the metal, what happens to the metal, what do you think? If the rope is constantly being rubbed against the metal here, what do you think is going to happen to that piece of metal? 
it'll heat up, right? Okay, so if it heats up, this piece is connected via metal through here. Now, I really, this, this, this picture is not so great. This piece right here has to be an insulator for this to work, I believe. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm crazy. I think this piece right here has to be an insulator. So what you have is a metal rod that goes down into the water, okay? And then that metal rod is actually stirring the water a little bit here, okay? Stirring the water also should cause it to heat up a little bit. So you have a combination of the heating up of, um, let's read what they say. The water warms as the paddle does work on it. The the temperature rises is proportional to the amount of work. I don't know. I, I don't know if they're getting all the details right here or if I just misunderstood it when I did it. When we did this lab, like an actual lab of this, the the, the way that it heated up was due to friction. I don't even know if there was a paddle in the water. I don't remember there being a paddle. I just remember that it heated up due to friction. And then what you do is you say, well, there's work being done, clearly, because you're lifting this object, right? This object is basically levitating, if you think about it. And so you can equate the work that you do to like something like the number of like rotations here or something like that. But at the end of the day, the point is that you can heat up water either by rubbing things or by increasing the temperature here, and then you can quantify exactly how much heat it takes to raise the temperature of water. And that's what we call quantity of heat, is you wanna figure out how much energy is needed to raise the temperature of water by one degree Celsius. How much energy is needed to raise the temperature of water by one degree Celsius? And this type of an experiment can quantify exactly what how much that is. Sorry, by changing the size, it gets rid of my things. Um, yeah, so... I don't know why we don't have this lab at the school. Maybe this is something I should develop. It wouldn't be hard to do, because there's a lot of examples of this lab and a lot of equipment that you can get. All right, so how much... That's the question. How much energy is needed to raise the temperature of water by one degree Celsius? And the answer to that has to do with something that's called a calorie, okay? So we define one calorie as the, um, well, let me put it in joules. One calorie is 4.186 joules, okay? And one calorie is the energy needed to raise one gram of water, probably distilled water, right? Um, by one degree Celsius. And specifically, it's between two temperatures. It's from 14.5 degrees Celsius up to 15.5 degrees Celsius. It may be from 15.5 to 16.5, but I think this is what it is. Um, in general, we're gonna kind of assume that water, you know, will only need this much energy to go from like 60 to 61 or 61 to 62, but the definition of the calorie, which is happens to be, so keep in mind, the calorie is a unit of, what does this make it a unit of? What is the calorie a unit of? What does, the, if, if I tell you that one calorie is equal to 4.186 joules, what does that mean calorie is a measurement of? It's a measurement of energy, right? Exactly. You all kind of know that in some way, right? Because when you purchase food and it tells you that it's 500 calories, you know that that means that when you eat it, it's gonna give you some energy to do things, right? Your body gets tired, you need a replenishment of energy, just like your car needs more gas to keep going. And for you, it's, it's food. You eat food and you drink beverages and those things give you energy. They give you an amount of energy that's related to the amount of calories that are in, in the object. Now, four joules isn't much energy, right? Four joules is a very, very tiny amount of energy. So obviously one calorie is not a lot of energy, but then again, it's, it, should, it shouldn't really take that much energy to raise only one gram of water up, to, up one degree Celsius, right? But when you purchase food, um, let me use another color so that this kind of stands out a little more. Oops. Let's 
So on food packages, um, what they what they write is um, calories. So on food packaging, they use a calorie and it has a capital C. Capital C calorie is one kilocalorie, which is to say that it's a thousand calories, the lowercase c. So in food packaging, it's actually one calorie is actually 4,186 joules. And that is a sizable amount of energy. Yeah, Christian said that food isn't kilocalories, that that's right. Okay, so keep that in mind. Uh, the, the calorie in physics and the calorie in your food might be off by a factor of a thousand, but I mean, what's a factor of a thousand? Like, it's pretty easy to convert something that's uh, just divide by a thousand or multiply by a thousand, right? All right. So with that definition of what the calorie is, there are other measurements of heat. There's also a measurement of heat called BTU, which stands for British Thermal Units. You may see that show up in your uh, in your in your homework, but uh, um, you know, a BTU is another you know, I don't think I need to go into much details about that. You, you all know how if you find a unit that you're not aware of, you can go look it up on the table, right? So BTU is another version of uh, another unit of heat, the British thermal unit. Okay, so given this setup, I think we can go into talking about um, specific heat now, I believe. That is the next... Yeah, 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 yeah. Because these two are related to that. So how much time do we have? It's 1018. Should we take a break right now? Let me define specific heat and then we will take a break. Oh, I left one thing out of here. Just give me one second. One other equation that I want to put on this. That I thought I put in here. It's on the previous slide. This one. All right. Uh, we're down here. So two different ways to talk about specific heat. Now, my understanding is that many of you have not taken chemistry. Is that correct? It seems like most people have not taken chemistry. Is that right? Um, have you all heard of specific heat before though? Have you heard of the concept of specific heat? So Kim, when I... Yeah, I guess what I'm wondering is like, did you learn about it in high school? Is it like, I, I don't know. I remember, I think I took AP Chem in high school, so I probably learned it there, which is probably similar to your intro to Chem class, like Chem 4, Chem 1A. You learned it in high school, okay. So some of you have heard of it before. I would assume some of you haven't heard of specific heat before, though, right? So let me just, uh, let me describe this in as much detail as I can. We'll set up the theory and then we'll go through uh, how do we solve problems. All right, so I told you that water takes about um, 4.186 joules or one calorie to raise one gram of water by one degree Celsius. Specific heat is the same idea, but you have to apply it to pretty much any substance. Now you can look at this table right here and you can see water shows up on this table. And this is specific heats and molar heat capacities at constant pressure for different things. There's a lot to take in in this, in this table. So I'm just going to leave it there, and I'm going to talk about specific heat with you. So specific heat is defined as the heat required to change temperature of a certain mass. That's Q. So Q is very commonly going to be the quantity of heat. So when I think Q, I think quantity of heat. Okay, so Q is heat. Keep that in mind. That's how we measure heat. Q is heat. It's either heat added or it's heat removed. It can be positive, it can be negative, but we call it heat, okay? It's a way to quantify how much heat has been transferred or energy has been transferred between two objects. On the right-hand side of the equation, this is equated to, this heat Q is equal to how much ever mass of the substance you have multiplied by the specific heat and then multiplied by the change in temperature that the substance experiences, okay? So this is a direct relationship between the heat that's added and the resulting temperature change. And it depends upon specific heat, C, and M, mass, okay? So C is the thing we wanna talk about. What is this thing called specific heat? You know everything else in this equation to some extent, right? Q is heat measured in joules usually. So that's a type of energy, right? And the question is, given energy into a system, 
what is the temperature change you get out of the system? That's what specific heat's gonna help us know. Okay, so C is specific heat. This depends, this is different based on each material. You can see the table over here of um, how it's measured. It's measured in joules per kilogram per, per Kelvin. This can also be degrees Celsius, but it's joule per kilogram Kelvin. And you have all of these different quantities right here. Now let's talk about what this means. Let's pick two materials that have a nice ratio between them, like uh, maybe iron and aluminum, or 470 times 2 would be a little over 900, right? Yeah, let's do iron and aluminum. So say that I take a piece of iron, and I take a piece of aluminum, right? And just to make things simple, let's say that I take equal pieces of each one of these, okay? So I have iron here. I have aluminum here. Um, let's just take one kilogram of each one. So we have one kg here. And let's say they both start at the same temperature too. Let's say this starts off at zero degrees Celsius. And then I have a kilogram of iron at zero degrees Celsius. Uh, let's do let's do Kelvin actually, just because uh, of reasons that'll become obvious here in a second. Okay, let's do one kilogram at let's say three hundred Kelvin for this one, and let's do one kilogram over here also at three hundred Kelvin. So they both start off at the same temperature, right? And then we add heat to them, and we do that by just you know the normal way, right? We um we heat each one of them up. We put, the, put, put each one of these on some kind of a stove or something like that, right? So we add heat in, ca in both cases. And let's say that we add, I don't know, like, let's say we add 30,000 joules of heat to both of them. That's our quantity of heat that we're adding to both of these, right? Okay. Specific heat is related to how much energy do you need to raise the object's temperature by one degree Celsius, right? Aluminum has a specific heat of 910. Okay, that's aluminum. Let's put it in blue. This is aluminum right here, 910. The specific heat for iron is 470, right? All right, so here's the question. Which one is going to be hotter? After it's absorbed all this heat right here. Is it going to be the aluminum or the iron? The iron. How did you figure that out? How did you figure that out? It takes less heat to change its temperature. Exactly. That's what this means. The 470 versus the 390 means that it, its temperature will change faster than the temperature of the aluminum. You're right, if you solve for delta T, let's do that. For, so in our, in our problem, we're gonna have delta T is equal to Q divided by MC for one of them, and then the same thing for the other one. Since Q is the same for both, the mass is the same for both, C is the only thing that's going to matter. So whichever one has the smaller C is going to have the bigger temperature change, right? So the answer is that it's going to be the iron. Because the specific heat is smaller. In fact, the temperature change should be almost exactly twice as much, right? And we can figure out what it would be here. So for, for the iron, if we plug in uh, 30,000 joules... Mm -hmm. We plug in the mass, which is one kilogram. And we plug in the specific heat, which was 470. Sorry. 470 joules per kg degree Celsius. We get an answer here of. It's about 64 degrees. And without even doing it, I can tell you that the other one's going to be about 32 degrees. For the aluminum, the change in temperature is going to be 
the same thing times is it nine ten? Yeah, almost almost exactly. It's thirty three, but it's pretty close. If these numbers were exactly double, you get exactly double. But you get the idea. Thirty three sixty four is uh, and I guess I should technically put this in Kelvin since I used Kelvin in the problem just to make sure no one's confused. So this would be Kelvin. And this would be this would be Kelvin as well, but the change in temperature in Kelvin is the same as the, the same as the change in temperature in degrees Celsius. So specific heat tells you that the lower the value is, right? The lower the value of C, the faster the temperature is going to rise for this type of object, right? Now, given that, okay, does that make sense to everybody? The lower the value of a specific heat, the quicker it's going to heat up. The higher the value of specific heat, the slower it's going to heat up. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Okay. Now, what do you notice about water when you look at this list right here? What do you notice about water? Has a really, really high specific heat. In fact, I believe it has one of the highest specific heats that we know about. It Maybe it has the highest specific heat. Did you all learn that in your chemistry class? I suspect we can design certain types of water that have higher specific heats. Like, I'm willing to bet that, like, heavy water might have a higher specific heat. I don't know. We let's look it up during break. But um, heavy water is water where instead of it being H2O, it's D2O or D is deuterium, which is a um, isotope of water. I don't know. We should look at what the specific heat of that is. You learn in biology it's one of the reasons why water is so important for life. Absolutely. So what does it mean that it has a high specific heat? That means, as we learned, that for water, it takes a whole lot of energy to change its temperature, right? So if you have a body of water, like let's say a lake, right? Let's say that you live near a lake, or let's say you live near the ocean like we do. We've got this massive body of water that will not change its temperature quickly. And you know that here in Los Angeles, even though it's warm pretty much 365 days a year, right? that the, the ocean is still very, very, very cold. And there's more than one reason for that. It's not just because of specific heat. But the point is that even with the sun shining down on the ocean every single day, it's not enough to keep the temperature of the water hot. And it also means that if you live near the ocean, that the temperature changes that you experience will be much less drastic than if you live, let's say, in the desert, farther away from the ocean. And that's because the water is going to tend to heat you up whenever you're cold and it's going to cool you down whenever you're hot because it's always its temperature is always going to lag behind the land's temperature right the land if the sun's shining down on it will get hot very quickly right if it's a hot day today and you go outside the the temperature of the sidewalk heats up and down very quickly the temperature of the water though doesn't heat up and down very quickly which means that um yeah like i said the temperature changes you experience will be much less drastic this is really obvious if you look at a um a weather map of what's going on in in fact, we can probably just randomly pull one up here, um, and it'll probably be, um... okay, it did Las Vegas. I didn't want to do that. I want to do Los Angeles. If we do a map, if you look at the Inland Empire areas, and you look at the temperatures, the temperatures are almost always hotter. You all probably know this already. I don't need to pull up a map to show you this, right? But you all know that, how do we get this? Will this give us a... Uh... Okay, God, I can't, we can't just... Well, we'll just do this later. The point is that you all know that uh, the temperature in the Inland Empire is always much, much hotter than the temperature on the coasts, right? Beach cities like, you know, Manhattan Beach, Redondo Beach, San Pedro, all these uh, Huntington Beach as you go up and down the coast. These, these, if you live near the coast, the temperature is very, very mild. And when you hear that the temperature is going to reach 110 in the valley or something like that, it might only be 80 degrees where if you live, if you live near the ocean. And this is largely because water helps to make those extremes a lot more, a lot uh, more manageable. Yeah, low 70s near the coast, high 80s, low low 90s in London. Yeah, exactly. Because we have this beautiful body of water over here. Now, it's not the only reason, by the way. I don't want, you to, I don't want to pretend like this is the only reason, but it's a big reason. It, it's a, it plays a very large, large effect on it. Air, land, heat up really fast, and they cool down really fast. Water, it does not. And so it acts as basically like like a heat battery, if you think about it, but it, it can cool and it can heat. So it's uh, it's it's really nice to live near the ocean um, because of this. Anywhere in the world, even where the ocean is hot, this is still true. Like in the Gulf of Mexico, it's still true that the water is going to help you to have 
uh, less extremes. Now, that being said, the weather near the ocean can can cause problems. Like, if you live on an island country, then, yeah. Okay, one other thing about this. Let's talk about this when we come back. Let's take a break. It's been one hour exactly, so we'll take a break for... Uh, is that why water only freezes at the top on lakes? I don't think it's specific. Wait, okay. Um, let me think about that question. I'm going to start the break right now. I think that that's because water, water's density uh, goes up when it freezes, so it floats on the top. I think is the reason. I may be wrong. Okay, we're taking a break until uh, we got to do 10:42. Like recording today, I was good. 